Welcome to Getting Sketchy Live, brought to you by TheVirtualInstructor.com. And now, let's get sketchy. That camera's supposed to be on me. Hello I'm there, everyone. Sorry. Matt here with TheVirtualInstructor.com, and welcome <laughs> to Getting Sketchy Live, the greatest live broadcast in all of YouTube, where the operator of the cameras doesn't know which camera button to push. But now I figured it out. Welcome, everyone. I hope you are having a wonderful day and are looking forward to the next hour, uh, or maybe a little bit less than an hour, where we, well, not me, but Ashley, who's sitting over there, we'll say hello to him in just a minute. We try to create a drawing for you inside of 45 minutes. And in this season, Ashley and I are choosing our own subjects and our own media. And Ashley has chosen pastels this week in a still life. And uh, we'll get into that in just a minute. But first, let's say hello to Ashley. Ashley, how are you doing over there? I'm doing well, Matt. Thank you for asking. Sorry you guys had to suffer through my profile at the beginning of the show, but I'm glad to be with you. I'm super excited about our reference tonight, so if you haven't checked it out, do so. And I hope you'll be following along or just watch and pick up some tips along the way. Absolutely. Um, so Ashley's going to be drawing for us in just a minute. And of course, during Getting Sketchy, we don't just draw and create art for you, but we also try to sprinkle in some instruction, which we'll be doing tonight as well. If you are watching this live on YouTube, there's a chat box. Of course, you can interact with the chat box. You can post comments and questions if you want. If you do have a comment or question that's directed at Ashley or myself, we encourage you to use the super chat function. It does cost a little bit of money, but it does help the channel out and it will get your comment or question prominently displayed within the chat box and we will definitely address it for you. Um, so I would encourage you to do that if you have a question or comment. Mm -hmm. uh, Ashley's going to be working from a photo reference tonight, and you can find that photo reference on the community tab at the YouTube channel. So if you look underneath this video, you'll see a little icon in my face. Clicking on it will take you to the YouTube channel, and then you'll just need to look for the community tab. And there at the very top of the community tab uh, or on that community page, you'll see the uh, photo reference uh, posted for tonight's live lesson or tonight's getting sketchy. Um, now we're going to have the photo reference up, of course, during the broadcast. So if you want to wait on that, you're, you're certainly welcome to uh, wait on that. But uh, if you want to go ahead and have that photo reference ready, you can have it at your disposal. And of course, I would be remiss if I didn't remind you that if you like this type of stuff, stuff, make sure that you give this video a like. And if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel. Now, if you want to take your drawing and painting skills to another level, of course, um, you've got to go check out the membership program at the virtual uh, getting sketchy gives you a little bit of a glimpse of what our live lessons are like, which are part of the membership program. But there's also courses which are extensive and include downloadable illustrated eBooks. There's a year long curriculum for visual arts teachers, which, can, which includes all the resources that you would need to teach for an entire year. Um, I do weekly critiques as part of the Members Minute where I critique member submitted artwork each week, which is a very valuable tool for learning how to be a better artist. Uh, all of that is included with the membership program, of course. If you want to learn more about the membership program, I have left a link below this video. You can go check it out. Everyone starts out with a week-long trial for free, so you can see the program's right for you. There's also a 30-day money-back guarantee as well on top of that. If you want to just check out three of our course videos and ebooks for free, there's a link for that in the description below for uh, as well. And that will put if you sign up for that, that will put you on our mailing list so you're notified uh, when new videos are posted, new lessons, and of course you'll get our newsletter as well if you do that. All right, um, is that it? Yeah, I think that that's I, I think that's everything say? we need to say before we start. So let's go ahead and take a look at our materials and paper. All right, well let's get into it then. All right, so you guys can you guys can see the reference there. Um, that's a reference that I took a few days ago of a pepper and onion that I think has yet to be eaten in my house. So we'll spend a little time with these pep this pepper and onions, and then hopefully I'll spend a little bit more time with them uh, in a meal. Um, Matt and I were talking about the color scheme or the perceived color scheme before the show started. I'm having a little trouble defining this color scheme, but it's close to complementary or maybe split complementary. So either way. We've got high contrast in color, um, high contrast in value. One of the objects is quite a bit darker than the other. 
and uh, we're working on a toned paper. Yeah, and let me chime in on that. Okay. Oh, yeah. uh, the original plan was for Ashley to work on black paper. So right. when I posted the video information, I did put black paper in there, um, but Ashley changed his mind, which is totally acceptable when you're <laughs> two, an artist. Two hours ago. Um, and uh, I made the change there, for, but for you, some of you who, who got on early and knew that we were using black paper, uh, we threw a little curveball at you. Um, so hopefully you can hit that, that curveball. And I think you'll do just fine on black paper as well. The yeah, reason absolutely. I changed yeah. paper was actually not the color at all. Um, it was the type of paper. I had. I have black paper. It's the Canson color line paper. And I was just, I was getting, a, I was preparing it a couple of hours ago and just feeling its surface and then feeling this Metons paper that I had next to it. And that changed my mind. So the, the difference between the color line paper and the less rough surface of the Canson Metons paper, because each side is, is a little bit different. Um, the difference is small, but there's just a little bit more of a fiber texture to the Canson Metons paper. So that's what I chose, even though I'm going to be still working on the smoother side. And I've cho chosen the smoother side of the Metons paper because the image isn't crazy big, and uh, I don't want the tooth of the paper to seem too, too large, uh, too dominant for the size of the artwork. So speaking of size, um, our picture plane tonight is nine by 7.5. It's really nine by 7.4, but close to 7.5. So I think that's a five to six ratio. So you could you do a five by six or, um, or you could use any five by six ratio of your choosing. If my math is correct, I'm just doing it in my head right now, but I'm in any case, this is nine by 7.5. A lot of times we draw a little bit smaller on getting sketchy because of the time limit, you know, just to make sure we've got time to cover our space. But pastels cover space um, rapidly. So I thought we could go a little bit bigger. So it's almost or close to a sketchbook size. Let's go ahead and take a look at the pastels I'm going to be working with. So it's a quite a conglomeration here. Um, we've got two different brands of pastel pencils. These are all from different sets that I have. And uh, we have new pastels. These are the, the thinner sticks. And then I also have some some soft pastels that are that are really their Blick brand. So I'm not actually sure who 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 manufactures them. But in any case, we've got hard pastels, soft pastels, and pastel pencils. Both Derwent and Stabilo um, are the brands. And we're just going to mix them all up. You know, I'm not too concerned about since this is a, a sketch and we only have a limited number of layers that we'll get to in 45 minutes. I'm not too concerned with um, which pastel is harder and which is softer and building up those layers because. Uh, like I said, we're using the smoother side, so it would be a little bit restrictive in um, building up just numerous uh, layers of pastel and, and then the time limit, too. So we're going to mix them all up and just use what's the right color, um, regardless of, or the close to right color, really, uh, regardless of which of the pastels are harder or softer. So I've just pulled these pastels out in the, a lid just, uh, just to use as a tray. Um, to make it a little bit easier and a little bit faster to find the color that I'm looking for, if I don't have to, uh, if I don't have to choose the right color from a full set that has lots of colors that I don't need, so that'll hopefully um, keep me in the creative process and uh, and from and keep me from messing around in the pastel set when I need to be messing around on this paper. So besides that, we're going to start our drawing with a pencil. This is just an F pencil, so it's very close to a number two pencil, which is also an HB pencil. It's very, very, very slightly lighter, probably imperceptibly lighter, but it was already sharpened, and so that's why I chose it over a 2B or an HB. So anything from F to 2B, I'm pretty good with um, drawing, drawing with. I do have a kneaded eraser, so we'll probably be employing that a little bit, and then I have a little tiny pink eraser or a piece of one that I've cut just so I've got a sharp little edge, a sharp little side that I can use if I need to. So don't worry. Um, I've got the rest of the eraser, and I'll use it all. And I even have a, a whole eraser if I have to go to it. But in any case, I like to cut my erasers up and have all these little edges. So I've got a, got a few more of these. If these get too dirty, I'll just grab another eraser piece, and that'll give me cleanish edges to work with. All right, I think that's the end of our materials explanation, Matt. I think all it's right. time to start drawing. So, um, uh, when you bring up the timer, I'll begin. All right, here we go. 
So I'm going to use uh, the picture plane to help me lay out my, my first shapes. And hopefully you'll be able to see these marks okay. I'm just kind of considering how close some of these edges are to the edge of our picture plane. And then, of course, um, I'll compare them to themselves. One thing I want to check is where the center of my picture is, like the vertical axis. So I'm holding my pencil up to my reference, and it looks like the edge of the pepper makes it just to, over to the right of center. So I know that I need to at least make it to this mark. I know it's a little hard to see on the brown paper, but I need to make it to this mark in some fashion, um, or my pepper is going to be a little bit, a little bit dwarfed maybe by the empty space. So I'm not looking so much as at the bumps of the pepper, but just imagining if some of those little valleys were, were filled in, you know, where would the straighter sides be? So it kind of looks like a, kind of looks like a distorted stop, stop sign right now. We'll find some of those specific bulbous contours um, in the pastel. We want to get to the pastel as fast as we can. Yeah, it is hard to see on the brown paper, but this is going to be a quick layout with the graphite, and then Ashley will be putting colors down pretty quickly. So um, if you're struggling to see it, that's understandable. If you're creating a drawing yourself and you're using the same approach with the same paper, um, it's going to, your pencil lines are going to be faint anyway. So I just wanted to point that out there. All right. So I'll just step back for a minute in case I'm casting a shadow so that you can kind of get a feel for about where these are. You'll notice there's sort of a diagonal. I think I'm a little low on the onion, but there's sort of a diagonal that's made by the bottom edges of the onion and the pepper, and that's one thing that I'm looking at and comparing to my reference about what that angle is. All right. Um, I guess it would probably be beneficial to go ahead and lay in where the green part is going to go. And it's really one, two, three. It's kind of like a pentagon in there, an offset pentagon. So, we've so got... I assume we'll talk a little bit more about the color scheme oh, yeah. that we were talking oh, yeah. about before. When we jump, start pulling our yeah. colors out for sure. And Ashley... Ashley likes to pick two objects for some reason. I know, I know. I know it's against <laughs> the rules. I'll, I'll just point out that it's easier to create uh, a defined focal point when you're working with odd numbers of objects. Mm -hmm. um, you can still do it with two. It's, it just sometimes can be more difficult. But Ashley's pulled it off in the past here on Getting Sketchy. I'm sure he'll pull it off. I did a whole time. season of things that come in pairs. Yeah. And it's, it, it, it is challenging. It was fun and it was challenging. Um, to try to figure out how to arrange those pairs and uh, and still have a composition that that feels feels balanced and uh, and and somewhat dynamic. Now, I will say that I feel like that the the roots on our onion, they're so light, they almost play a, th a third part. You know, we have a, a light passage here, a darker passage in the onion, and then a little splash of light mm -hmm. way I over here that. on the right. Yeah. So and I think that actually helps with the balance. All right. Okay, Mark is wondering if there's any advantage of sketching with a graphite pencil over a pastel pencil. Uh, I don't think so. You could sketch with a pastel pencil. Yeah, yeah just, you can just sketch with a well. pastel pencil. The, the only difference is that the graphite is going to be covered up mostly by the pastel applications. And if you do have a good amount of the pastel pencil on the surface, that's going to blend in and mix with the colors that you add, which is not going to be that big of a deal. So... And I could have sketched with two different colors. Yeah. You know, like a yellow and a, and a violet. Yeah, you could do that too. And that would have helped to take care of any mixture, incidental mixture you might get. Pastels are definitely a medium that are forgiving um, because you can layer over the top of your applications. Uh, you do have to keep in mind that the tooth of the paper, the texture of the paper is going to play a role in how many layers of pastel that you can apply to the surface. But when you're working on a textured surface like Ashley is, you usually aren't going to run into that issue. Um, but they're very forgiving. So if you started with a graphite pencil or you started with a pastel pencil, uh, you're going to be fine either way. So my plan here, you got to have a plan, even if you don't stick to it. My plan here is to do this artwork in three steps. So we're going to work with uh, just getting colors down, get the surface covered so we have material to work with using our base colors. So I've got a yellow-orange right now, or maybe it's a deep yellow. You might think of it as a deep yellow. It's kind of like cadmium yellow deep. But I'm looking at it as a yellow-orange. And uh, 
And then we'll add, once we get our base colors all over the page, we'll work with our shadows second, and then work with our highlights and lights, our tints third. So base color, and then shadows, and then light. All right, I'm, I'm working on a flat surface, or flat, it's, it's laying down, it's not tilted. So I will probably blow the pastel occasionally. You do have the oh, vacuum cleaner. Oh, that's right. We've got the, the studio vac. There we go. I haven't actually used this thing yet, so. I, I've only used it uh, once or twice. And the first time, obviously, was to turn it into a ready-made last season. I mean, that's <laughs> right. That's right. I, for a second, I was worried my drawing You're was going to come off the screen. You're using a piece of art to uh, clean up your art. <laughs> All right, again, continuing with our base colors. I'm just getting a little bit of green or hey, maybe it leans a little bit yellow green in here. And of course we'll be lightening that. There is some darker green passages in there. Let's see what this new pastel does. Oh, oh, that new pastel is nice and bright. So let's go ahead and put some of that over the top. Looked a little different um, before I made a mark with it. And we'll get our stem area. Just get it covered. Just get something on there. All right, there we are. Let's go ahead and, you know, we've got a lot of paper showing through, but some of that will continue to be covered as we build up our layers of dark and light over the base color. Now, the onion has a has a quite a range of color in it. And I've got a few um, pastels chosen, sort of red-violet pastels. So I'm going to try them out. And I know we're putting down base colors, but the contrast is so great on the onion that I'll probably use a couple of colors, um, even, I guess, kind of start with the rendering a little bit, even in the base layer. Yeah, that so, pink is electric. Oh, I'm telling you, this is going to be a bright one. Now, the, uh, there's some really dark colors in here, so we're going to have to mix some color to get down to those um, super darks. So... This is going to seem pretty extreme, pretty bright, um, but we'll need to put some reds in here, and there's even some, some orange reflecting into our onion from our pepper. So already starting to modify the contours of the original pencil drawing to reflect the contours of our actual objects just a little more closely. Oh, can you hear that squeakiness? I'm going to use a little bit of black in here. And work that in with my pencil. And of course, you know, the I wasn't I was gonna use some black paper and now I'm not. So we'll have to go ahead and address the background as well. So the background is a black surface, but it's mostly not black, it's mostly gray, um, just because of all the light that's hitting it. So we'll start with a gray. Someone pointed out that if you had the sheet as as blue, then it would be close to a primary scheme. Oh yeah, it would be close. Mm -hmm. Or you go with maybe like blue or or, or blue-green, possibly? Uh, Thea, uh, Ashley is working on Canson Mitant's pastel paper, and he's using the less textured side of the paper. That, that paper has two textured sides, and uh, the less textured side is the side that he's working on. Both sides have a pretty heavy tooth. I'm just using the side of the pastel. And a lot of pressure just to get as much material on here as I can in our first pass. All right, and in, uh, with uh, 10 minutes into the drawing, we at least have touched all of the square inches of our paper. and We've got something to start working with. Do a little, little clean up over here. Are you going to get break, a vacuum it now? Yeah, break out the vacuum. <laughs> just uh, 
suck those little pastel bits right up. Now, are you muting my microphone when I do that? No. Okay, I'm not sure how loud it is. No, there, it folks. can't be that loud. Um, okay. Yeah, it's not as loud as it is for us, that's for sure. Okay, good. I hope not. All right, we'll I like to take a deep inhale right over the top of the artwork before I blow the pastels away. Just, just suck it up. Just to get... Just like, just so I can feel in my lungs that I'm creating art. Yeah. I just want to feel. You want to go I, into the mirror and see <laughs> streaks of color underneath your nose. I, I just want to feel a little bit of pain in my lungs. <laughs> well, it'll do it to you. Just get a little, some, you know, I don't want to make this picture about the background, but it has a background. So we'll go ahead and do a little bit of modeling back there. Yeah, Keith, it sounds pretty quiet to you guys because of our mics and the way the mics are set up. Right. But it, it, it's not that quiet. Yeah. It doesn't sound like a full-fledged vacuum. It sounds like, oh, let's see. The only thing I can compare it to is a it sounds angry a small liter v12 compared to a <laughs> uh, <laughs> to a big liter v8 yeah a little bit uh, you know, yeah. a little bit <laughs> so go start Nobody's your cars out in your driveway and listen to that so all right and we'll get back already into getting our, some wrinkles going on there yeah Matt, I'm sorry. There's going to be pastel dust. Oh, that, there's pastel dust everywhere. all over. I can sit here and see the top of the table covered with pastel right now. That you didn't. Yeah, yeah. You didn't put. Okay, there. good. Makes me feel. Yeah, it's uh, it's a little bit better for a good wiping down of everything. There's pastels and charcoal and all kinds of dust on all of the equipment that's near Ashley. There's probably some on the table that I'm sitting at too, actually. There's all right, doing a little bit of finger blending in here. It's okay to do that with pastels. I don't do this with with graphite, but I'm on getting my fingers in there with pastel. All right. Now let's go ahead and we may go back to the background. Uh, time allows, of course, but uh, let's go ahead and jump into our pepper and I'll work up the pepper pretty far and then move over to the onion just to keep my hand moving from left to right. So I like to use <clears throat> analogous colors to shade with when I'm working with um, brightly colored subjects. And, and this is yellow or yellow orange. And the color that it's analogous to yellow is orange and also green. And I think there's a lot of orange in this pepper. So I'm going to pick out, hmm, an orange or a red orange. And I might still put some green actually over here because the, the black cloth is to some degree uh, reflecting into our pepper. And when you yellow and, and black kind of mix together, um, what we end up with is more of a green. Yellow and black make green. So the pepper has all these bulbs all over it very much like distorted spheres so a lot of gradation in each of these bulbs pastor james asks can the pastels pastels dust cause some breathing problems when you use pastel uh the answer to that is yes mm -hmm. they definitely can and i've used pastels so much for so many years i think i've developed kind of an allergy to it whenever i use pastels the next day i have some sinus issues, <laughs> uh, but uh, I know what I know what's causing it at least. Yeah, and I have uh, sometimes resorted to wearing a mask when I use pastels, since um, we have a lot of masks around. You just got a lot of extra <laughs> masks, yeah. right? I think we all do. Put them to use. All right, I am getting my green in here some over the orange. Of course, green and yellow. Green and orange both have yellow in them, so they're related colors. And the green's kind of toning, toning the orange down a little bit in places. Right. Mm, well, let's see. I have brown ochre. 
just looking at my browns now in an umber color. So I might take the umber into the orange a little bit, and that'll, again, tone it down, introduce a little bit of a neutral. Yeah, it's it can be difficult to get uh, slightly darker values when you're dealing with yellow. Sometimes they had the tendency to turn a little bit green. Yeah. And uh, so when you're trying to tone down a yellow and you're trying to keep the temperature uh, warm, you might consider using a darker brown for that instead of using like a black or a neutral color. Uh, Ashley's green that he added is going to keep those shadowed areas warmer because the green he's using is a warmer green over a cooler green. In fact, um, sometimes when I'm painting, I'll mix um, next to my pile of white, I'll mix white with just a touch of, of, a, of a warm color. And when I need to lighten a warm color, I'll use my warmed up white instead of my regular white. So I kind of have a warm white and a cool white kind of make that on my palette, um, pre-mixed on my palette so that uh, I don't lose some of the intensity of my warm colors when I want to lighten them, when I want to make a tint. Right, I'm not exactly sure which yellow this is, um, but it is. it definitely has some white in its mixture. All right, there's a question. Do you use workable fixative with that paper to get more layers? You can you can use workable fixative sure. on pretty much any surface um, to kind of create kind of a pseudo layer that will allow you to put a little bit more layers on. But really the, the most important factor in, in getting as many layers as possible is the texture or tooth of the paper. Uh, workable fixative can give you just a little bit more, maybe a little sliver more, uh, but... Choosing a textured paper when you need lots of layers is is something that definitely should be considered. Yeah, and I saw it. I don't know if you addressed it. Sometimes my ears turn off. But I saw there had been a question about drawing with pastel in a sketchbook. Okay. And that's a good re that That's a place where if you sketch with pastels in a sketchbook, you probably will want to use some fixative, even though it uh, can darken your colors a little bit because the rubbing of the papers back and forth against one another in a sketchbook, um, there will, it will smell, smear your pastels, that subtle shifting of papers. I mean, it even does that to graphite drawings sometimes. Can be a little bit uh, careful how you handle your pastels when they're finished. And probably the best thing to do is take them out of your sketchbook. All right, got a nice collection of greens in the stem just because uh, it's pretty high contrast all by itself. I'm going to go ahead and jump into our onion for a little bit, and then we'll hopefully have time to kind of come back to everything with another pass. Yeah, you got plenty of time on the clock. I feel like I'm currently 20 like I'm in a race. Before. There's, ne there's well, ne that's the never nature. enough time. That's the nature of getting sketchy. Yeah, yeah. So you're using a purple here. Yeah, so right a dark now. dark purple. Right, and it's it's really bright, and I probably need to hit that with another color. I've done some finger smudging in the background, but I like to try to do as much of the mixing as I can by layering my pastels. Of course, the onion has its own pattern going to become a defining feature. There we go. And Have on. you seen any of the glass onion or there's the, the it's the knives out movie. Have you Some ever? of them. Okay. But, but I, have, I, I think there's, there's my, only my, two. my family watches movies that are fun to watch when I'm over here doing getting sketchy. They're probably <laughs> watching a great movie right now. And uh, they've watched some of those while I've been um, over here drawing. Well, the newest version is called Glass Onion. And I I thought the first Knives Out was was better. But okay. uh, I can't help but think of a glass onion when I'm looking at the red onion that you're drawing right now. 
because it's got that shininess. Yeah, that's true. It is shiny. I love those very attractive highlights on there. And I love how the variegated pattern of the onion breaks them up a little bit. Yeah, I know it might be considered famous last words to say plenty of time yeah. over a nebula. But uh, Ashley is using pastels and he has a lot of the paper covered. And for getting sketchy, that's pretty good. Yeah, right. that's pretty good. Sometimes the paper that's doesn't get covered until after the timer right. sounds. Well, I want to get the paper covered as fast as possible so that we can slow down and start doing a little bit more rendering. Let's try this redder color. Let's try it out a little bit over the top. Yeah, I think it does need, it looks like in that transition area from the darker shadow on the left. Like through here? Yeah, there's definitely some red, oh, some yeah. warm red and in there. And there's, you know, orange right next to the pepper too, yeah. which is going to help with its reflective, uh, communicate its reflective surface. Yeah, when I was taking a picture of it, you know, there, I was very simply thinking, well, it's yellow and purple. That's a complementary color scheme, yellow and purple. But it's not. You know, the onion is really a red-violet, and, uh, and the pepper is really yellow-orange. So those are some, some tertiary colors. So Matt and I have determined that it's most, most like a split complementary color scheme because the green or yellow-green also... Um, plays a part in the in the color scheme. All right, just checking my pencils out again, and we're going to introduce a little bit of French gray, where some of that brighter purple was. It's a warm, very, very warm gray. And uh, there's quite a bit of warm colors in here, so should harmonize all right. Of course, our onion looks a little bit a little weird without its roots on there, but we'll get to the roots. Got to get to the roots. Near the, yeah, got to get to you the You always got to get onion. down to the root of yeah. the matter. Yeah, root of this problem. There we are. I'm going to put some white in here, but not for the highlights yet. I'm going to, I'm going to work it in. So it may appear to be like similar to the highlights, but we're going to work it in. Get our fingers involved a little bit just to pull some of these marks together. And revisiting the background a little bit so that the contour of my onion shows up better while we work. Of course, it, it is darker in that area, so... I need to do that anyway. So bouncing around, I like to bounce around a little bit sometimes. You see something you want to change, just go ahead and change it. Do it then. Do it then. These uh, This food is making some people hungry. People mm. think of fajitas or sauces, and other know, types of food. Of a, yeah. I'm glad I ate before I came. Lord Engine asks, is there a general color strategy for layering pastels? And um, 
Ashley, you want to answer that first? Well, um, it, some, I know I was told and taught early on to, and I, I alluded to this earlier, and, and that is to start with harder pastels. It's not like a really color strategy, but a medium strategy. And that would be our, our small sticks, the new pastels, and then gradually work towards the softer pastels, layering those on top because they'll go over um, the harder layers pretty easily. So that's kind of a best practices that uh, that I was I was at one time uh, was one time suggested to me for a way to work, but I'm not sure about a color strategy per se. Uh, yeah, I I can echo on a couple of those things. First of all, uh, with the hard pastel, soft pastels. I often use pastel pencils over the top of soft pastel applications. Pastel pencils are typically harder mm -hmm. um, and they work just fine. So um, the, it is true that the softer pastels are going to cover easier over the top of what you've already got in place. But some pastel pigments, for whatever reason, especially I've noticed this with the Rembrandt pastels, so, some pigments are harder. Uh, or some colors are harder than others. Uh, in in the same type and line of pastel. Um, so, and sometimes I've run into issues where I've put down some of the harder pastels and not been able to cover over them very easily with the softer pastels. Now, in regards to color, um, the easiest way to approach a, a particular subject is to break it down into the most basic color that you see and cover the entire shape with that color first. That's exactly what Ashley did with the um, the pepper. We covered it with the yellow first and then started developing the values and adding additional colors to add more depth and interest to the color. So that's the approach I like to take in most circumstances with pastels is I'll look at the overall shape first and try to mimic the shape with one solid color and then go back in and adjust the values. And as you're adjusting the values, it gives you the opportunity to add colors that are similar so that you can build up more depth and realism in the drawing. All right, I bounced back to the pepper for a little bit with my French gray. Um, and Mark is saying front to back, essentially. Um, oh. If you're talking about like the order of how to address things within the uh, picture plane, uh, that's something a little bit different. Um, it makes me think of the pastel landscapes we used to yeah, do with our it's, kids. It's, uh, <laughs> what you want to try to avoid with pastels or colored pencils for that matter is any type of glow that might develop around the edges of objects. And if you work your foreground first and then go in and add the background, you're running the risk of creating that kind of glow or haze around the edges because you're having to develop the background after you develop the foreground. The way to alleviate that or prevent that is to work from the back to the front, like you mentioned. Or if you're thinking about a landscape, you work from the background to the middle ground to the foreground because you can overlap your pastel applications over the top of what you've already got on the paper. So you alleviate that issue with the glow or the haze around objects. Uh, you don't have to work that way, but if you're dealing with a landscape, especially let's say that you have a tree in the foreground and it has leaves that are going to overlap portions of the sky, it wouldn't make sense to do the leaves on the tree before developing the sky entirely, because you can make those marks for the leaves right over the top of the applications that you have in place for the sky. So, in those circumstances, it is pretty important to work from the background to the foreground. But in an image like Ashley's working on here, he just needs to, to make sure that his edges are as crisp and clean as he wants them to be to alleviate that, that glow. So that means he might work the foreground first, like he did with the pepper, mm -hmm. and then address the background. But at some point, he'll need to come back and address the edges of the pepper after he's completed the background. Hopefully all that makes sense. All right, so we're putting some other colors now in our onion. I've gone ahead and put a little red and then a little orange into it, close to our pepper. And now I have what feels kind of like a navy blue type color. It's a dull blue. And I'm just adding that into our shadowed area. 
So I'm trying to stretch those. And using that blue instead of a black is going to make the image feel more interesting. Yeah, and we may even put a little bit of it in the background too, or in the shadows in the background. Give them a little more life. Go ahead and try that a little bit over here. All right. Okay, Don Leon says, is it better to lay down the dark soft pastel colors first and the lighter over the dark? Kind of like you use the light color first and then darker when doing watercolor paintings. You know, I've heard people say that, um, but you really don't have to do it in that specific order because any color that you apply over the top is going to cover completely or partially cover the color that you have underneath. And of course, you can blend the colors that you put over the top with the colors that you already have in place as well. So um, if you feel more comfortable working from dark to light, you can certainly do that. But you do, in some circumstances, need to make sure that you preserve light areas. Even, you know, if you make an area super dark, if you don't have enough tooth of the paper available and you try to layer a light value over the top, some of that dark color underneath is going to mix with that, that light color. Uh, so I don't think you necessarily have to follow that that rule uh like and it's not not really a rule but i have heard other people suggest that you start from dark and go start with darks and go to light that is a common practice with oil painting yeah i was gonna say that it's like how rembrandt worked and since pastels are sometimes considered a painting medium even though we're applying them dry that is the approach that um some painters might um suggest that you you take but in my experience it, it, that's you don't you definitely don't have to do it that way uh, it, going back to what i said earlier i think if you're new to pastels and you're just starting out you just need to think about starting with the basic color that you see uh you know define the color that you see like at the very beginning ashley when he was referring to the pepper he said it was a yellow orange pepper mm -hmm. <laughs> So he started with a yellow orange and then he's added some lighter yellows and some darker oranges to build up more depth in the color and also some green to create some warmer shadows. Um, so I, I think that's really the best way to approach working with pastels. If you're new to pastels, uh, instead of trying to come up with some formulaic approach to applying the material, even though what I just told you was kind of a formulaic <laughs> approach. <laughs> What I'm saying is, uh, what I should say is, instead of following some kind of unwritten rule uh, on how you should apply the materials, because there are lots of different ways to apply lots of different media. And there's lots of people out there that will tell you that this is the way to do it. Mm -hmm. And that's a way that works for them. And uh, I've seen lots of people use materials in uncommon ways and get also uncommon results. And sometimes those uncommon results are great and sometimes they're not great. Um, but if you don't try and you don't experiment, then you'll, you'll never know. Um, but if you're just starting out, start at the basic color and then manipulate the values and add depth to the color as you go. Um, using my cool yellow again. In our pepper. June points out, look at those messy hands. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's what happens. That's, cool. I love <laughs> that's great. You know, I felt you like get when, your hands dirty. when we went live, it already looked like my hands were a little bit dirty, but it was just, just from putting my pastels into my tray. I mean, you just, you just can't, can't get around it. Can't help it. Well, you can see how those blended areas are starting to read more naturally, uh, especially in the background. Doing a little tapping. Just to knock down some of the strokes. Now, you know, we're saving all our highlights to the end. So I'll look, I'm looking forward to that. All right. I think I want to look at my contours a little bit. Of course, I'm working with a relatively light gray. So all the grays have to be mixed down. 
This black cloth is actually a cape for cutting hair. It's like the cape that you wear <laughs> when you get your when you go to the salon. My or it's a cape for stylist. being a superhero. It's probably yeah, the right. cape you wear when it's, you go out at night it's and turn into cape. I won't tell vigilante. you vigilante. Right. And Gotham. What would your what would your superhero name be? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a toughie. All the good ones are taken. They're not taken. It's got to be Batman. Some... Doesn't well, get much Batman, greater than you that. Know, if you would have told me Batman when I asked you that question and yeah. Batman didn't exist, I'd be like, that's a horrible name. <laughs> Who wants to be the Batman? Right. Like, because it's not really an, that's an like endearing saying, animal. Right. I'm that's pig like, man. I'm squirrel man. Right. Right. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Strike beer. I'm a little small rodent. Better watch out for me. Oh, I'm, I'm sure. I think Mega Man's a pretty good name. Oh, yeah, that's a great that's name. A, it's a video, video game, game, but it's still, yeah. still a good name. I agree. All right, let's see. Got eight minutes, so... Gonna have to move on to our highlights and roots soon, no matter what. All right, let's do it. Let's put some highlights in, then we'll go to the roots and then see how much time we have left. So I'm gonna use a new pastel. I also have a soft white pastel. <laughs> yes, Jan, I know that bats are rodents. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love bats. But though. they're not far off from rodents. Flying rodents. We have bats, a lot of bats in my yard. And when I go into the backyard and, and hit golf balls with my little little plastic golf balls, you know, practice yeah. ones, the bats in the because I do it in the evening and the bats are out and they fly down to to take my golf ball out of the air and then they I guess they realize what shape it is with their sonar. Yeah. And dive off just at the last second. <laughs> I'm surprised. But I love that. Tried to eat your golf ball. Well, I don't like, and I don't think anybody likes mosquitoes. And that's where the bats come in. So I've looked into buying a bat house. You and, would be looking yeah, into buying a bat I, house. And I'm, I'm putting a bat house in my backyard. <laughs> it needs to face, I think it needs to face south. You, you don't want a bat house, okay? Because <laughs> what the bats will do is they won't live in your bat house. They'll, well, some of them will, but the rest of them will go live in your... In They're like, the, hey, look at that chimney up there. Yes. It looks pretty inviting. It will, it will live in your attic space or... Yeah. Well, maybe if I make a nice place for them, they'll prefer their their house. No, they will they will live in your house. Well, do not entice bats. I'll let you know how it goes then. You're not gonna do that. Yeah, don't they, don't do they that. They sell them at hardware stores, and you hang. And they have to be hung 25 feet up in a tree. I think facing south. You're encouraging bats, <laughs> right? To to eat all the mosquitoes. Then I don't have to use mosquito spray on myself or you know, put those stinky lamps out in the yard, the well, tiki torch lamps. you know I am an experienced me mosquito that's control right. technician. Oh, that's right. I forgot. Yes. Oh. Um, and I'm talking about Matt's favorite insect right now, the It's mosquito. not my favorite insect. Uh, for those of you who don't know. He's when, a mosquito scholar. I, I worked for a <laughs> summer when I was in college as a mosquito control techni technician for the environmental health department. Um, oh, and gosh. what we did is we would go exterminate mosquitoes, but we'd do it in a humane way. And we would also collect no the mosquitoes. No mosquitoes were hurt in their extermination. And track <laughs> the species. Uh, now, what we did is we'd go out and we would uh, disperse these poison donuts. And uh, basically, it's some type of like corn grain or something that's got some type of bacteria in there that the larvae eat. And it kills the larvae so that the mosquitoes can't reproduce. Okay. And the larvae lives in areas where water collects. Oh, yeah. I can vouch for that. And the really bad mosquitoes, which are the Asian tiger mosquitoes, are the ones that are very aggressive. And they live in containers. So, like, like 
buckets and like buckets and, 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 and flower and pots things. and so things you, like that. You want to get rid of mosquitoes. You want to get rid of your containers that are holding water. All right, and we have That's a super chat. All right, yeah. Yeah. from, yeah. Yeah. from yeah. Sonia. And Sonia says, soft pastels are for me. Oh. Heart, 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 heart. Oh, Go, Ashley. I hope you're drawn along. Smiley face with stars, smiley face with stars, and then another smiley face with stars in the eyes. Pretty awesome. Thank you so much, Sonia. We really appreciate it. All right. Just yeah, pastels are pretty awesome. All right. I'm too much um, set for a minute. Oops, that's the wrong one. Also, something to know about mosquitoes, it's only the females that bite you. And the mosquitoes that live naturally in like swamps and natural areas of standing water are less aggressive than the Asian tiger mosquitoes. Because they've got a nice natural place to live. They don't live in a bucket. And the way you can They're tell the difference happier. is the Asian tiger mosquitoes have striped legs. So if you have a mosquito that lands on you and they have black and white striped legs, then that is an Asian tiger mosquito. That's interesting. And I think I've seen the stripes before, noticed them. I just didn't realize that's how you can identify them. Now, I am not the mosquito man. I only worked... It was an internship. He for only a, played one on TV for a biology major, but I knew the guy who ran the program, and that's how I got that job. I, I wasn't a biology major, but um, I did. Con I was close to majoring in biology. Actually, I was thinking about being a uh, medical illustrator when I was a senior in high school. Uh, so, so, in the mosquito world, if you want to get ahead, it really is who you know. <laughs> I, if you want to work for the environmental health department, you know. uh, yeah, it was, it was an interesting job. And by the end, uh, for the, for the next several years afterwards, I did not get a reaction when I got bit by a mosquito. You know how, when you get bit by a mosquito, it'll raise up and, and oh, yeah. itch, uh, mosquito bites had no effect on me whatsoever. You were... You'd built up a natural immunity of some sort, and, I guess. And even so many times. Yeah, and even now, if I get a mosquito bite, it's very minor. It does not swell up, and it really doesn't itch very much. Well, that's so. that. I would. I love that. I would give anything to have that kind of immunity. Well, all you got to do is get bit a bunch of times. <laughs> <laughs> and I feel like I should have that immunity, and I've been robbed of it. My daughter and I both swell horribly when we get bit by mosquitoes. But my wife and son, not so much. Uh, well, we would we would go out and we would hang these little traps and lure mosquitoes in with dry ice because dry ice would put off. Listen uh, to carbon, these tricks. Carbon dioxide. How about that is that's science right and there. And the mosquitoes would think it was a living organism, so they would they would fly to it, and get trapped in these little traps, and then we could we could determine what species they were and kind of map out where they were in the county. And down here in the South, mosquitoes are a uh, big deal. Oh, yeah. They're a big deal. And the farther south you go, the bigger they get. I can't believe the first time I visited New Orleans how, how large their mosquitoes were. All right. So we're working on our roots. So here, this is an example of Ashley putting a hard pastel over the top of a soft pastel. Yeah. And you can see it, it still works. Goes over just fine. Yeah. Now, I, I do keep rolling the tip a little bit, you know, just so I can keep finding relatively clean spaces because I'm picking up some gray pastel as I go. I'm working with the outside pieces first before I get into that nest of roots. Now, are you planning on removing the tape at the end? If we have time. I think that'll be a that, you know, it's, nice little thing. Yeah, it's fun to do on, on, on camera. Kind of cleans up the edges, makes it feel, gives you the impression of, of what framing does to an artwork. And uh, framing an artwork 
uh, really makes it feel finished. Frame a half-finished artwork, but we'll think it's finished. All right, so for my route so far, I've just used this very light color. And I've got a, a medium light brown that I'm going to put in here in this area. So that's still... Oh, gosh, time's up. I wasn't looking. All right, let me just throw those little pieces of brown in there. It's okay. Last week, I think I went over maybe five or ten minutes. And I think I did, too, the week before that. So, um, so we're going to finish can, this one. You can carry a on... Bit. A little bit more on time, but I think those, I think the roots here are making a real difference in our composition. Brazen Heart, I can see how uh, Minnesota would have a problem with mosquitoes. I think there's a lot of lot lakes, of, oh, a lot yeah, of lots of bodies water, of water in right. Minnesota. But if the water is running and moving, uh, the larvae have difficulty living in that. So mostly it's stagnant water, water that's kind of pooling. That is typically the problem. And mosquitoes are tricky because they'll lay their eggs in areas where there's no water. And then uh, a period of time can go by. And when water comes, then Ooh, that the is larvae tricky. come to life. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, devious. So if, you're, if you have a mosquito problem, the easiest way to fix it is to get rid of anything that can hold water around your house. And also, if your neighbors have anything that can hold water, these are things like bird baths. Then, then uh, sneak over into their yard. Right. That those are take care of those, those are where the bad mosquitoes uh, grow and develop. <laughs> About that. See, we show up for for some art making, and we leave with biology. So, well, quite a the information show. I just gave you could save your life. Technically, it could save your life. That's right. Could you pick up diseases? You could. Is that what you're thinking? You could. You pick you up could, yes. mis diseases from mosquitoes. All right, I'm going to tap some of these. Might need to vacuum it one more time and just just incorporate some of these last touches. And somebody tap. says, my neighbors are the problem here. And yeah, that's, that's yeah. typically what we found, is people who would call yeah. us for mosquito problems, we would go and find that they're the problem was really a surrounding property. <laughs> yeah, and you can't do anything about that. I guess you could leave a note on the door of those other folks and just let them know they have a mosquito problem and that you could fix it. Oh, no, we took care of it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, that's right. You guys were working for the government. Yeah. Do what you want. Yeah, we, <laughs> we can do what we want. Fixing, yeah, fixing <laughs> it. It's for your safety, ma'am. Isn't that what the government's? It's for your safety. And, uh, and then you have the authority. Now, Lo lots of good comments about your arts. Yeah, um, I think we'll go ahead and peel the amazing, they're, they're fabulous pretty, job. It's pretty juicy looking now, you know, pretty shiny. It's like candy fruit, candy onions, candy onions. That's a funny, that's a funny thought. Well, I got candy yams. Okay, this is a sweet onion, so it's not a Vidalia onion, but it tastes pretty sweet. I don't eat a whole lot of sweets anymore, and uh, other things in life are starting to taste sweeter to me because I'm... I guess I've become more sensitive to that flavor. I had to stop eating a lot of sugar. What, things for... like the taste of victory? Oh, onion. Yeah. <laughs> That's always sweet. All right. Let's go ahead and uh, and peel the tape off of this one. Okay. And Orion Nebula has a good question. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, This go is ahead. A, a pretty common question. Uh -huh. And her question is, what was the benefit of using the tone paper since it's all covered? Well, it's not all covered. There's little bits showing through. Um, I don't know if we can see them. If you'd even be able to see when I'm zoomed in, but there's areas of the pastel that is less, more and less covered, and the you know you can think about oh gosh look at these looks like I just crawled out of a coal mine. Um, you can think about the temperature of the paper maybe and the value of the paper more than the actual color. So mm -hmm. it was a warm tone, and some of that warm tone is is still coming through and hopefully um, contributing to the the final result of the colors and doing it little bits where it, where it does show through in tiny little places um, contribute to harm. No, I'm sorry, contribute to the unity of the artwork, which is um, anything that holds and ties the artwork together besides how you're using the elements of art, like line and color. So it unifies the art and can influence the tone of the colors. And, and I'll also add that starting on a uh, paper or using a paper that has a tone or a color, 
uh, you're starting essentially with a value other than white or black. And that allows you to better evaluate the colors and values that you add to the surface from the start, from right from the beginning. If you were working, if you worked on white paper, you could definitely create a, a great pastel drawing on white paper, but you're starting at one end of the value scale and you're having to work to push all the values darker. So I'm, I would speculate that if Ashley started on white paper, that yellow application that he applied to the pepper initially would feel overly dark mm -hmm. it would it would it would be it would it would give him information that was inaccurate uh, just because of the contrast between the white of the paper so starting when you're working with a colored medium especially or when you're working with a medium that allows you to add light and dark values it's always a good idea to work on a paper that has some type of tone or value associated with it doesn't have to be a brown paper like ashley used here um, it could be any paper that has some type of value associated with it other than white or black. Um, now, when as he's tearing the paper away, though, you can see those specks of the paper showing through, and they are they're, affecting... They're a little more clear when you have the reference, I guess. Right. Yeah. They are affecting the harmony and the unity of the piece. If this was done on blue paper, it would the image would have a little bit of a different feel associated with it. And honestly, some of those warm... Uh, colors that are so bright, they would be doled down because of a cooler paper. Mm, that's true. Uh, Diane asks, do you only blend with your fingers or do you sometimes use other tools like a blending stump? Yeah, sometimes I use a blending stump. Of course, it takes a little bit of the feel away. Yeah, and the blending stump, um, it gives you a little bit more control, mm -hmm. but it doesn't do as good of a job as blending with your fingers. We often tell people not to blend uh, graphite with your fingers because it kind of turns it into a little bit of a paint yeah. where pastels and charcoal are, uh, you, it almost feels like you have more control when you blend with your finger. <laughs> it's, I mean, I can, it feels like I can touch the paper more gently, Yeah, you know, just and to get more feedback, get a little bit more feedback. Okay. Keith right. says, would you still cover entirely, even if the paper was black to start? Um, yeah, I would still try to get it covered. You know, I wouldn't want the black of the, if the paper were black, I think it would make the this pepper look great. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't want to leave raw paper because that's going to create a little bit of uh, disconnection where right. there's mark making in lots of places and then like a really smooth black untouched area for the shadow. Yeah, it, it would look, look unfinished. It would, yeah, it would feel unfinished and, and actually it would probably become an accidental focal point. It would stand out because of its emptiness or lack of mark making. All right. Well, I really like Great the reflection questions. on the onion. Yeah, I, the... I do too. I really like how that uh, how that reflection on the onion turned out. Um, of course, the colors are, you know, my onion is a little more, more purple than in the reference because of the colors that I chose. So maybe it ended up closer to a complementary color scheme um, after all. Uh, someone is saying, don't forget the stem shadow. I see what you're talking oh, about there. Yeah. yeah, there's a little oh, bit of shadow. Oh, gosh. Hold your horses. <laughs> and here it comes. <laughs> yeah, just a little bit of um, French while gray. He's that shadow, Terry says, amazing what you accomplished in such a short time. There we Love go. It. June says, looks so thank beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> beautiful, excuse me. And I'm gonna get a little bit. Um, here. Deborah says, perfect, beautiful work. Thank you guys for your warm comments. That keeps us motivated and moving. All right, there we go. A little bit of darkness under there helps to separate that stem. It is a little, um, you know, it's kind of foreshortened. It's coming out at us, so the shadow does does help it. Mark is putting plenty of time in quotations. <laughs> mm -hmm. Plenty of time. Yeah, this is, sure. I, this is actually finished pretty it, it, in a decent amount of time here for getting sketchy. We have uh, 25 minutes to our next show, and oh, usually that's good. we have like 15. So. Yeah, that's good. Um, and so we yeah. need a little extra time because Matt's starting a brand new live lesson yep. series. If you are if you haven't you know joined or haven't started a free trial, today's a great day to do it because it's a brand new series. You'll be starting from the ground floor. All right, um, we'll go ahead and switch over and uh, say goodbye to you guys. Let's switch out over here. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed that. I certainly enjoyed watching Ashley 
develop the pepper and the onion and make those colors really pop because they certainly do pop. Uh, hopefully you could see that from the video. Uh, as Ashley mentioned, I am starting a new live lesson series over at the Virtual Instructor. Right after we go off the air here, we're going to be uh, starting a series on Scratchboard. So mm. if you're a member and you're heading over there, we'll see you in just a few minutes. And uh, if you're not and you're just uh, watching on YouTube, that's fine. We'll see you right here next week. Next week, I'll be doing the drawing and I'm going to be working with charcoal. Um, I haven't decided on my subject yet, but I have decided on the medium and uh, we'll be working with charcoal next week. So uh, pastels this week, charcoal next week. So uh, we're just going to make sure that everything in the studio is covered with a nice thin <laughs> layer of dust. Yeah, uh, we're going to sound like Marge Simpson's sisters pretty soon. You know that yeah, right, we're going to talk like this pretty soon. It's all going to be all that dust. So, well, um, thank you guys for for sticking around and uh, um I hope your drawings turned out well and if you're going to draw later i hope it turns out well and if you don't draw the pepper and the onion keep your hands involved keep your hands dirty and uh, we'll do it all again here next wednesday absolutely and i'm already feeling like i'm like marge's sister a bit. <laughs> I, I think it's uh the weather has got been warm here the last few days and um my allergies are yeah i think that's contributing to how everybody's me. feeling yeah. is this, this I, you know I'll dramatic change bring in temperature. the warm weather I'll, I'll deal with whatever uh, coffin and I think stuff. I'm with you. Steve says, what's the theme for to the live tonight? We're going to be doing a series with scratch board and we're going to be creating an image of a beat. So, uh, tonight we're going to be talking about scratch board, how to use it and, uh, probably going to transfer our image and get everything set up. So, uh, anyway, if you like this video, make sure you give it a like and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And, uh, we wish all of you the very best uh, in your own artistic journey, and we're grateful that you've spent the last hour with us, and we'll see you next week. Good night, everybody.